trembles in my presence! Kicking off part two of this list, we now find ourselves at League of Legends. Now when it comes to magic users in League, we could have picked a lot of different champions, such as Ari, Karthus, Lulu, or the poster character of the game, Ryze. But in the end, we decided to pick probably the most sinister of them all, Vagar. Under the subtitle of the Tiny Master of Evil, Vagar is one of the most evil and powerful sorcerers on the continent of Valoran, let alone in all of Runeterra. He was born and raised as an ordinary yordle in Bandal City with a strange fascination of the outside world. After coming of age, he left Bandal City to become part of a trading business. However, after being set up and framed by fellow traders, Vagar was imprisoned in the city of Noxus for years, and because yordles are bound to suffer through isolation, Vagar completely lost his sanity while locked away by his cruel jailers. By the time Vagar escaped prison, he had become twisted and seek to bring the city-states of Valorant to the ground. Thus, he trained with Runeterra's greatest magicians in the art of dark magic and became one of the most powerful wizards to ever grace the Summoner's Rift. And that's no understatement. Vagar is actually one of the best mage champions in the entire game because of his overall high damage, his powerful spells, and his mage-killing ultimate, Primordial Burst. Vagar is a reliable champion to have on your team, especially when pitted against other mage champions, and is overall one of the more interesting characters via his twisted personality and intriguing lore. Also, he is the owner of probably the greatest skin in League history, Final Boss Vagar. You wish to hear my name? Fine. It is Mages, the Mad Magician. Despite how much the Hyperdimension Neptunia series really likes to poke fun at video game cliches, I've always seen it as a bit odd that there's only a small handful of characters that can be considered spellcasters, and none of them are as true to the definition as mages. Most of the DLC characters throughout the series still get thrown under the bus compared to the main characters, especially since Victory's DLC characters have no role in the story at all. Mages, on the other hand, really stands out simply for how... enigmatic she is. The human characters of the series are all based on and named after a third-party company, but Mages is a bit harder to dissect. Mages is the name of the company who made a visual novel by the name of Steinsgate, and Mages is made as a homage to its main character, Rintaro Okabe, as well as being designed after Kurisu Makise. All this put together, Mages stands out for acting so unlike the rest of the cast, living up to her mad magician moniker and personality and playstyle, and being all the more unique for both. Living up to her name, Mages is a ranged character whose stats are built around utilizing a large pool of SP to blast the enemy as far as possible. In fact, she has the highest magic attack power of any character in the game, just barely beating Rom and Ram. Because of this, Mages' special attacks have the potential to do as much damage as an EXE drive, and by lifting the damage cap on her, the amount of destruction she's capable of is impressive to say the least. All in all, Mages stands out amongst Hyperdimension Neptunia's cast for many good reasons, and as a magic wielder, she truly has no rival in personality or performance. I'll burn them down with my formulas! Normally, the Etrian Odyssey series lets your imagination decide the personalities of your party members, but when a remake of the original game came out, that being Etrian Odyssey Untold The Millennium Girl, one massive update came in the form of a story mode with pre-made characters. Not long into the game, you meet the most prominent characters of the party, the Midgard Library Trio, and among them is an alchemist by the name of Arthur Charles. Arthur isn't the most intelligent magic user, and if anything, he acts pretty childish at times, but this actually makes him the main optimist of the party, and given how dark the Etrian Odyssey games can be, having a voice of reassurance makes Arthur all the more likable. It's actually pretty hard not to crack a smile when Arthur speaks, especially with many of his interactions with Rakuna and Simon. His habit of trying to use Buffy speak to explain his magical prowess also leads to some pretty funny moments. In battle, Arthur is the one and only mage in your party, and while he's pretty weak against physical hits, his high elemental attack makes him your greatest asset against bosses and foes. But while he's a more important character to his game's story than Mage's was to hers, Arthur has two drawbacks. The first being that he doesn't have complete dominance over elemental attacks, as Frederica's can also be quite potent. And the second being that he can easily be reclassed into a completely different class, no longer making him the mage of the party. Despite that, for the Etrian Odyssey series' first attempt at making a magic wielder with a fairly significant role in the story, Arthur's a great ally to have on your side, and we can only hope that he and the other members of the Midgard Library make some sort of cameo in an upcoming installment. There literally is no way to introduce our penultimate spellcaster than simply saying his name. Henry. Yeah! 
blood! Fire Emblem Awakening has its fair share of great magic units, and many of them could have made this list. But Henry is, without a doubt, the best magic user in all of Awakening, both in his magical capabilities and his personality. Let's cover the latter first. To put it simply, Henry's kinda crazy. For starters, he's about as sadistic as, if not more than, Tharja, as he wishes to see his opposition die in the most bloodiest way possible, and even dreams of dying a horrific death. But despite all this, Henry always has a huge smile on his face and is unusually cheerful about 95% of the time. Although Henry definitely has his sadistic moments, he's also shown to be a loyal friend and even retains some humanity, as seen in his support conversation with Olivia, in which he attempts to cure her of a curse placed on her. He also shows quite a deal of respect for the Shepherds, even going as far as to promise to slaughter whoever were to kill his fellow mages. It's quite evident that there's more to Henry than meets the eye, which makes him one of the more interesting characters in Awakening. Then there's his capabilities in battle. To put it simply, Henry is the best mage in the entire game, especially if you change his class to a sorcerer. If you do so, Henry will have the highest magic stat out of all the units, thus making Henry an absolute beast on the battlefield. He also contains a magic support stat boost for when he pairs up with another unit, making him the perfect person to pair up with characters like Tharja or Muriel. However, while Henry is a formidable wielder of the Dark Arts, the reason why he's the penultimate candidate on our list is because he can reclass into non-magic classes, namely the Thief and Barbarian classes. If this wasn't the case, Henry would have easily been number one. And here's where we reach the real challenge of this list. With a series like Final Fantasy, you're bound to find some impressive magic users. And believe me when I say that we had a lot of candidates to choose from. The most predictable choice would be Kefka Palazzo from Final Fantasy VI. However, while he is a formidable mage, he just isn't on the same level as Vivi or Nisir. Now at first glance, Vivi, the signature black mage of Final Fantasy IX, looks like an ordinary black mage, but upon playing the game, you soon realize that he's much more. Vivi was a black mage doll created by the evil queen Bran, who had begun mass-producing an army of black mages after being influenced to do so by the game's main antagonist, Kuja. However, after an accident, Vivi escapes from the queen's grasp and becomes curious of the world around him. It's this curiosity that lands him in the middle of an attempt kidnapping of the queen's daughter, Princess Garnet leading to the events of Final Fantasy IX. As a character, Vivi starts out as very clumsy, shy, and extremely gullible. However, upon encounters with several dangerous forces, most notably against three advanced black mages known as the Black Waltzes, Vivi becomes much more confident in his abilities, but continues to question his existence after discovering the black mage dolls. But where Vivi truly shines is in battle. Being the only playable black mage in the game, Vivi is one of the most reliable party members in the entirety of Final Fantasy IX. Especially since not only can he cast a huge array of elemental spells, but he can also enchant Steiner's blade with his magic and allow Steiner to use elemental attacks. This power also transfers over into his trance mode, in which Vivi's magic stats increase and he is given the ability to cast two spells in a single turn. It's been confirmed by Square Enix that not only is Vivi one of the most powerful of the Black Mage dolls in Final Fantasy IX, with his power rivaling that of the Black Waltzes, but that he's also one of the most powerful mages in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. If that doesn't confirm Vivi's spot at number one, I don't know what will. I'm the One-Winged Angel. And I'm the Kitsune Hawk. And here's to Square Enix for creating one of the best examples of a magic user not only in video games, but in all media.
The heavens have spoken!